What is up, everyone? Welcome to a special edition of Den of Geek Presents Marvel Standom. Uh, so way back at New York Comic Con in the fall, I spoke with the folks behind Marvel's Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur animated series, which is coming to the Disney Channel on February 10th and Disney Plus on February 16th. Now, I know this isn't really an MCU thing, but folks, you got to trust me on this. This show is an absolute delight. It hits me as an animation fan. It hits me as a Marvel fan. It gets me as a New Yorker. It even has all these cool nods to Jack Kirby. If you know where you're, you know, where you're looking with it. It's really, really good. I've seen the first two episodes. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so what I'd like to do is turn this over to the producers and voice cast behind Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. It's a fun interview. I hope you like it. Devil Dinosaur is so, I don't know how to describe it. He's almost like a big Labrador retriever, he is. Right? He's a 10-ton dog. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he loves her. Lunella would do anything for her. She knows how to interpret my chirps and my... Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah I <laughs> totally agree. You go, Moon Girl. Do your thing. For somebody like me, who's a big comics fan, right, and I go back to the original Jack Kirby comics, mm. which are so different from the modern comics that bring in Moon Girl. So when they brought this concept to you folks, what were your first thoughts? My first thought was this is something that I needed growing up. I watch a lot of cartoons, and I haven't seen anything like this showing Marvel and Disney's first black teenage girl superhero. It's historical, and it teaches like all the young you know kids like me that like quantum physics is cool, and one girl can make a difference. And I feel like that's a really important message that I needed growing up. Everybody needed that quantum physics message yeah. growing up. <laughs> I, the first thing I did was because I was not familiar with the uh, with the uh, comic book. I called my best nerd friend who knows how to keep his mouth shut. And I was like, what do you think of this project? He was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, you have to be in this. And so that was my first thing when somebody of his uh, ilk, I like to use the word ilk. Uh, and I will only speak in words that rhyme with milk. Uh, somebody, of, somebody of his ilk telling me, like, dude, jump on this, do it immediately. And then once I saw the scripts and the first day of recording with her, it was like, this is freaking Magic, yeah, like moon girl silk. magic. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love to say silk. silk. Uh -huh. Yeah, trying, uh -huh. trying. No, no, no. Um, yeah, same thing. I was just, I was amazed to be part of this uh, culturally relevant, wonderful uh, piece, and had no, I, I, I knew Devil Dinosaur because I played Hulk, and so Hulk and Devil Dinosaur have a past together. I knew Devil pretty well, but uh, it was uh, interesting to, I didn't know about Lunella. And you know, I didn't know that formation, and I just loved reading that script. And this is not only funny, but it's science informative yeah. about family. I loved it. The it's family, sort of the family thing. That's it. For it, totally hit me because I grew up. I have a huge family, and we were all in that same household together. And if my grandmother wasn't there, then next weekend she's going to be there. So we were always around each other. So to show that black, especially where I'm from, it, that black family dynamic of everyone really being there together and pulling for each other, and which is in this 100%, like that really spoke to me as well. Yeah. yeah they have the existing family and then the family that they end up making, you know, in the making of the superhero. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. What I also love about this it feels like a cartoon I would have watched growing up. Like, you know, it, there's a very classic feel to the pacing, to the jokes. You know, it has a great look, but it's centering characters that wouldn't have been centered when I was watching cartoons growing up. You know, it's talking about things, again, like the smartest 13-year-old girl in the world. Yes, indeed. Like, I love it. So it's just, but there's also these, like, this deep Marvel connection as well. So... I mean, does the Marvel element of it really kind of play into your performances at all? Or are you really just kind of approaching this straight up as just like this modern take on, on a classic cartoon feel? I'm just now getting into the comics, but I'm a big fan of like Spider-Man and stuff. So, and I remember watching um, one of the Spider-Man, the Miles Morales uh, Spider-Man that came out. And just, it's very similar to that into like how like... When I'm in the booth, I'm very much like all over the place. Um, 
very like action packed but along with that comes like the musical aspect yeah. i feel like that's what makes it different um from a lot of the marvel things because lunella sings a lot and raps a lot and each villain actually has a song that they mm-hmm. sing um so that's what i feel like makes it a little bit different we have these mixtape moments that while she's like kicking butt like there's like a fire song playing in the background yeah, it's, it's one of the few projects I've been on where the music, the art, the acting, and the writing all drive together, as opposed to just one thing supporting the other. That's what makes it a, a very different show. And everything is made by Raphael Sadiq. Yes. Oh my God, music. that music is so good. <clears throat> yeah. So, I, I, and I know you know this because you know almost everything, but for those who don't, like we lay down the voices first, we do the voices. So after recording the voices, I was like, this is fun, this is amazing, but then Later, when you get to see the animation that's been put to it, it makes you kick up your performance another notch the next time you go back in the studio because you see all the possibilities now, all the possibilities in that universe. Fantastic, man. So I've only seen the first episode, and the performances are already so kinetic, and it's already so fun, so I can't wait to see now like what the future episodes are like, knowing oh, yeah. what you it just gets said. Kinetic it informs you a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. Yeah, seeing it all done and seeing how visual it is. The, it's you have the art of the emotions going on. What would you call it? The it's uh, a kawaii. Yeah, you get yeah. to see a lot of the characters' emotions pop up in their eyeballs or like around in like little emojis, and it's yeah. very colorful. Inspired by New York's like street art. Yeah, Basquiat. And, yeah, Basquiat. It's oh wow! Really, yeah, it's yeah. a different look. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Fred, you've done you know these kind like these kinds of voices before. But Devil Dinosaur is so, I don't know how to describe it. He's almost like a big Labrador retriever, he is. right? He's a 10-ton dog. Yeah, he is. <laughs> and he loves her. Lunella would do anything for her. And they're not just a pet. They're partners. And they're friends. And where uh, I am weak, she's strong. You know, where, and we, we uh, and where she, she's strong, I'm weak. You know, and she's she knows how to interpret my chirps and my... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> I know I love them too. <laughs> you know, it's like that's just weird. <laughs> In the best of all possible ways, I just mean, odd. Yeah. If you bring so- if you bring a ten ton, you know, T Rex out of a portal, you have to learn his language. You know, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, she does, and that's in that, and she, he prefers being with her. That's yeah. home for him. You know, and I give you lots of hot dogs. Hot dog training, really important. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big part of New York too. Eh? Yeah, Gary. Yeah. And let me make sure I have this right in the episode as well. It, Pops is the one who's like the handsome, the handsome one. one. Yeah. Yes, Pops is the best looking. <laughs> like steals the show. No, Pops That's is like. <laughs> Pops is the one who's like, he's like, oh yeah, there's totally lizards in the sub in in the in the sewers, right? Was that was that Pops' line in the first episode? Uh, yeah, 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 yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And and just a little bit of background on Pops. Pops is Lunella's granddad. Started this roller rink back in the '70s just to make for the community because back then it was they would have like Soul Night where the black people could come and skate. So he's like, I'm making something that's all inclusive for the entire community. So yes, so he's got the the background of the Lower East Side, uh, that is his knowledge base. Uh, and even now, like, his place sits on what would be millions of dollars worth of property, but he's not getting rid of it because it's all about family and community to him. Uh, yeah, but, yes, th- that was him in the first episode. Yeah, so. okay. I love that line. I was like, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, like, this is just, yeah. Um, Diamond, the, um, did you know, like, right off the bat, was that was that first musical number that opens the first episode, was that built into the first script, or did that come after you had already been cast? Um, I think once uh, Raphael and everyone, like, knew that I could sing, they were like, hey, we should have her sing the theme music. And I was like, of course. Like, the song is incredible. Genius, inspiration, overflow. Ah! It's so good. Um, yeah, I had a I had a fun time recording it. Yeah, I think that was an afterthought, but I'm super happy they thought about me to do that. Great, thank you all so much. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> So first thing I want to know is how long you've been developing this show because it is such a 
I mean, it's such a very specific kind of concept and look and sound. So I want to know, like, what went into this and how you were first approached with, you know, the, the whole Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur idea. Sure. Um, it's been a while. Um, I think we started talking about this in 2016, as early as that. But it really starts with Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, he's a huge comic book fan. Um, and he went into his local comic store and he was just drawn to Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. He was also a huge fan of the Kirby Devil Dinosaur comics. So naturally, he just went right to that. And he fell in love with the comic. He brought it back to his producing partner, Helen Suglet, Cinema Gypsy, the company that made blackish, grownish, mixedish. All the and, and oldish, right? And said that we need, we need to make this. So calls were made and, uh, and, and here we are. But it took a while because we actually wanted to make sure that we got it right. We knew the weight and the importance of the show, but we also wanted to make sure that it had all the ingredients it needed, the music, the comedy, the drama. Yeah, we can't wait for it to come out. Yeah, we've been boarding, animating three years through COVID. We're like, ah, we want the world to see this. Yeah, the, pro the production was pretty much done all through the, the COVID years, yeah. as you see it. Yeah, so I did a lot of recording, either separately or at the same time, but you had people that were living on the East Coast and West Coast, but they were also recording simultaneously through Zoom and doing that. Yeah. So we had that going with us. But it's amazing the incredible energy they've had, even through Zoom, even through yeah, the walls. Yeah. It's like it really comes through, you know, There's that kind performance of like dynamic really comes through, performance. Yeah. 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 I mean, energy is the right word. Just having seen the first episode, it just kind of it like crackles, you know, like from the first from the first scene and that first song. And then just the way it go, the way it sets the scene on the Lower East Side and the roller rink and even the stuff at school, it just goes and goes and goes and goes. And there's never a second where something fun isn't happening, where something isn't like drawing your eye or, or attracting your ear. So, I mean, I'm not I'm not an animation guy. So, like, how how much of that was baked into this when you know from the writing process on? A hundred percent. Basically, it's about New York City. So New York City has a particular energy, a particular vibe. Everything is moving quickly. Uh, I'm from New York. Rodney's from New York. So we wanted to capture that energy kind of on film. But also, I'm a huge fan of Edgar Wright, uh, in particular Baby Driver and Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Um, and its fast-cutting kinetic sensibility was something we wanted to emulate in animation because you don't normally see that on a uh, kid's TV animated program. Yeah. Well, I think where it pops the most in our shows is the mixtape sequences that we have that are basically music video sequences where everything comes together, the action, the music, the color, and we even flip to different color palettes. And so it's just nonstop, like total magic and poppy, gorgeous colors coming at you. Yeah, so that's basically because we wanted to make New York shine and it's, it's in the character in itself and just, I know in a lot of cartoons that New York is just very generic looking and we wanted to really show New York, is, it's not slick, it's gritty, it's got atmosphere, it's got history, and we drew on the inspiration of street art, graffiti, Andy Warhol, screen printing, offsetting techniques, Basquiat, so we just wanted it to just look real cool. We had the graffiti, it was like done by a real graffiti artist, so it's just like we wanted to bring that authenticity to the look of the city as well as the characters. It's not just the city, like the sense of place in this show is so strong because you're talking about a specific neighborhood. Like you're on the Lower East Side and not just the Lower East Side, you're on the corner of Orchard and Delancey at one point, you yeah. know, like, so you're not messing around with that concept. Yeah, it was super important to me to be authentic New York City because like Rodney had mentioned, when you see New York represented, um, I, I saw an animated movie once where there was a hill and characters being chased on a hill. There's no hills in New York City. Um, and I wanted something that was accurate that you can actually go, I know that street corner, I know that restaurant, I know that park. Uh, to me, that was pretty crucial to the authenticity of New York. As much scaffolding that's all over the city, we have that in our show too. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's constantly under repair, under reno renovation. And also 
like you said, the characters. We have so much diversity in our show. We did that purposefully and thoughtfully, and that's because our crew itself is also diverse and is a true reflection of what you see in the Lower East Side. So we actually recruited a team that was as passionate about portraying that authenticity on screen. So the majority of our crew, which is actually really, really rare, but are made up of uh, women, persons of color, members of the LGBTQ plus community. So we're so proud that yeah. you have that level of People authenticity that on exist. screen and yeah. off. <laughs> yes, they can actually all animate and uh, yeah, be artists together on something as special as this. Maybe this was intentional. Maybe it is a happy accident. But because of that specificity, there is one really important tie to the original creator of Devil Dinosaur in Jack Kirby, who was born on Delancey Street. <laughs> yes. Like, who was basically born on, like, the corner of, like, Delancey and Essex. Right. So, like, so, like, whether that was, like, you know, whether that was accidental or not, it doesn't matter. Like, for all the fun, new, important things that you're doing with this series, somewhere in there, there's still kind of, like, the beating heart of the guy who, you know, who first made this happen. And I just was like, I was like, oh, my God, like, this is just such a fun coincidence. Or is it? Oh, it is. It is. It is not a coincidence. Um, Jack Kirby simply was one of the most, if not the most, influential comic artists of all time. To this day, we're still looking at his work to find inspiration, to find visual cues that we can kind of pull stylistically. You'll see we have in this show something we call the Kirby Crackle. Um, which we've kind of employed in certain certain effects for some of the villain characters and things like that. I mean, Jack Kirby is 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 kind of the the lead art inspiration of of basically everything in comic books. When you were designing this, like again, I don't I don't understand you know animation process and production and everything else. But like, how would you describe? How would you describe the look of the show or what you were going for with these character designs? Because like there's they're obviously amplified and, and cartoony, but they're also real. Like every single one of them is a real person. Like and it's not just, you know, sometimes sometimes on animated series it's like, you know, you have your like four main characters and, you know, they're very recognizable. And then like, you know, the the background characters or whoever are kind of who they are. I feel like every single person who shows up on screen is is like another lived in personality and right. I, I just i want to know how something like that comes together well it has a lot to do with the talent of our amazing writing team we wanted to make sure that yeah it did have that lived in kind of look that these are characters that are not just on screen to kind of move the story along to say what they need to say to get to the next scene these are characters that basically have depth it was important to me, to for the to feel cinematic, so each episode kind of feels like a twenty-two minute movie, and with that, you have to have the emotional peaks and valleys you would get seeing a Disney movie in the theater. You have to kind of feel all the emotions, you know, for it to feel like Disney. And and in regards to just the design of the background characters, it's just important to really just not do something that's generic, like you're saying. You know, I give props to our character designer Jose Lopez who was and I worked with him and just like taking pictures and going on the internet and looking up New York fashion and the way people dress you know Timberlands Air Force Ones you know these are things that are very specific to New York so we wanted to make that known and, and see that so that it doesn't come off as just another cartoon. Exactly we made it our mission to make it everybody not stereotypical. Yeah. So as much as we could go outside the box, and like Steve was saying, give everyone depth and multi-dimension, not just in their characters or spoken word, but in their look, was really, really important to us. It's like you look at that character and say, I know that character. That's my cousin. That's my uncle. That's my aunt, you know. And then there's the music. Mm-hmm. Yes. How- how did how did this happen with Raphael? Okay, oh, all right, God. that's that's a fun story. All right, yeah, he's I've, got a great story. I've been a huge fan of Raphael Sadiq's since the beginning. Tony, Tony, Tony. His writing, his producing work, his solo albums, everything. And so when I was developing the show, I realized this is the person he, he we, we have to bring on Raphael Sadiq. But you know, I was told, but he's 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 a genius. Very in demand, always working. I don't know if we could get him. So I said, all right, I got to figure out another way to kind of approach this. So his album, Jimmy Lee, had just come out. And he was doing a signing at a record store in L.A. So I went down there, first in line. 
And in the 30 seconds he was signing my record, I convinced him to be on the show. I literally pitched him in those 30 seconds. So by the time my record was signed, he was signed onto the show. And the thing that I always take away from that is, you know, people always say, you know, don't meet your heroes. But the truth is, yes, maybe you should meet your heroes because eventually they'll do music on your show. <laughs> so, you know, it worked out. But yes, he is absolute genius. He's doing um, all the songs, all the score. And it's, it's amazing because all of the songs have a different style. Um, we have songs that are pop, songs that are rap, songs that are Broadway style. Um, he, he can do anything. Literally anything, yeah. And just about the music itself is what really makes the show stand out. It stands out from a lot of shows, and even for Disney shows, you know, you're like, wow, this is Disney? Yeah, because yeah. Sadiq does not only the songs, but the score. Yeah. So he, a music produces the entire piece and every single episode just keeps getting better and better and does not feel like a typical animated show. It's so sophisticated, so um, layered, it's incredible in so many different styles like Steve said. And we feel like that way from just from the music to the, even the script, the writing. We, our writing team is amazing and they're made up of it's all women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> our know? entire writing entire team writing right now women. is all women which is uh, again really rare to find mm -hmm. animation. Uh, which has been really cool to work with. How many episodes? We have, uh, it was 17 episodes. Yep. 17 for and season it's a full one. story. There's a full arc. So there's the, so keep watching because there's some serialization and uh, some buildup. Can't wait to see him in February. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank That's you. So thank you. Thanks. And that's it for this special edition of Den and Geek Presents Marvel Standom. Don't forget to follow Den and Geek US on YouTube and twitch.tv slash Den Geek TV because that is where you can see some Standom episodes live. We've got live panel discussions coming all through the month of February uh, on a wide range of topics, including slash especially spoiler-free and spoiler-filled breakdowns of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. We got a look ahead to the rest of the MCU Phase 5. We got some fun, obscure stuff we're going to be talking about in upcoming episodes as well. It's going to be a good time, so make sure you hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to follow at Marvel Stanham on Twitter and Instagram as well. That's where you can let us know your burning questions and tell us what you want us to cover in upcoming episodes. And uh, I think that is it for this one. Remember, folks, we stand together. I'll see you soon.